welcome back and it's really a pleasure to introduce you to Ali Khan. Uh, Ali Khan is the founder and CEO at Shape Global and he has an extensive career as a CIO and also a medical advisor of AXA. He's been working in health since uh, many years as uh, his, uh, uh, as his um, young looking face can, uh, can deceive us. But it's a wealth of experience in healthcare for many years. So, Ali, uh, uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, you have about uh, 15 minutes, and then we start a Q&A for uh, questions that uh, you may have from the audience and also the remote viewers. Thank you so much for joining us, us Ali. Thank you very much for having me. Just to quickly check, Paul, you can all hear me okay? Fantastic, yeah. All right, wonderful. I'm going to share my screen and go straight into a presentation. And so we can make this a, a little bit more visual. Um, so hopefully this will uh, work fine. Um, so thank, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate um, speaking to uh, international audiences around the world. We are a small company. I am the CEO and founder of SHAPE. SHAPE stands for the System for Health Attendance productivity and engagement. And these are just some of the topics that many companies around the world are trying to understand better from the perspective of their own employees, as well as the entire organization. And within that, we talk about longevity as a key topic, and there are elements that I'd like to share and present with you today. So if I um, first ask a question, what is the health of your employees and your organizations worth? And many things come to our minds. Should we put a dollar value on it? Or are there other ways to look at this? But fundamentally at the heart of what we're talking about is what is that health really, really worth to us? Why should we invest in that? What is the role that we have as employers? And so if we take that particular concept, I'm not going to cover with you because I think everybody here today has a wealth of knowledge around the framework, the many agendas and the NGOs that are pushing out these best in class um, ad advisory and the guidance notes around what can an employer do in the context of helping their employees in the context of health. What I want to do instead is share with you um, an important message that I found that covers this quite well. If I move this a little bit down here, there is a clear business case for employers to tackle health inequality and invest in the health and well being of their employees. Not just because poor public health has consequences for workforce productivity, but because it's the right thing to do. Now, this is from Karen Taylor, who's uh, uh, the Center for Health Solutions at Deloitte. And when I look at statements like this, they're fantastic. We all agree that there is a link between health, uh, a role for employers and an impact positive or negative on public health. And we've all got to share the burden. But now let's break this down a little bit. If we look at the points over here, let's look at these keywords. We have business case to tackle inequality to invest in the health, look at the consequences, the productivity and the right thing. And when we start to decode these big statements, what we find, it's all of a sudden not so easy for us as employers to understand what is our role. So policy is one thing, but practice is completely another. And at the heart of all of these words is this key word we come back to again and again, which is measurement. Because business case is about measurement, inequality, investment, consequences, productivity, and whether we're succeeding in doing the right thing, it's all at the heart of that is measurement. So we are, I shape the employee experience measurement company. And what we've been doing is for a number of years researching if we were going to really truly understand the experience at work what factors would we want to measure and so if we start at eight o'clock we've got the factors outside of work because they impact you inside of work of course there is the famous psychological 
and the physical health. And then we also have work ethic, commitment, engagement, satisfaction. We also know that managers' style impacts employees in a really big way. So we measure that too. And then, of course, we have culture and key fundamentals that make up a business a business. And then we have the environment. All of these factors individually have their impact on the experience of a person. And as we'll find out later, there is a link between experience and how well people live. Now, if we go a little bit deeper, we'll find those experiential factors we talked about. They dig deeper into what we call the real experience. So let me just read some of these out. Am I in a positive culture? Am I being supported well? Do I have the right resources? Do I get enough activity? Do I have a good balance? Do I adapt well? Am I flourishing? What about my relationships? Do I have clarity around my job and know what I'm supposed to really be doing? Do I get regular reviews? And this is only some of the picture. There's even more that every person has to deal with in their experience at work. Illnesses, relationship at home, how that impacts confrontations and discrimination, conflict, they're all impactors, burnout, negativity. And on the left hand side, you can see the magic word ageism as well. Some companies are still practicing this all around the world. When you look at these words closely, you'll see every single one has an impact on the classic definition of longevity which is about at the core experience, but even from a traditional perspective, we're talking about experience of longevity, so morbidity and mortality. So when we look at those factors there, we've constructed a number of key stories that link to the core of longevity, and we're looking at the measures, the company environment that impacts the longevity, the health of course, experience measurement overall, diversity and inclusion, work-life balance. And is the company and the person themselves actively, not passively, but actively reducing the risks of the impact on their health? So we've got this major link. It's a huge and clear link between manage the experience, you manage the longevity of the employees. And that then has a positive effect on society and the communities and, of course, the public infrastructure as well. So this is a real example of data that I just collected this morning from a company here in the UK that we have actually just performed the SHAPE survey. And the survey helps us understand all the factors that we just showed earlier. And you can see here. You can see here physical health. What we're finding in our data is that nutrition is usually in the top 10 areas of issues for businesses, which brings that score right down. And if you look on the left hand side, you can also see culture. None of these scores are in the 90s, by the way. And these are these are scientifically statistically counted um, uh, methodology behind how we score this. Job satisfaction, it's lower than it should be. And look at the work environment down at the bottom. And engagement is the same. So these are opportunities to improve that employers can better make an impact on the longevity and the experience of the employee at work. Now I want to show you some of the things that we are doing to help from a classic health perspective but we are advancing the message. This is the world's first health age score. If longevity had a solution that could be presented, it would be the health age. It's a very friendly way of understanding where am I in my health according to my biological age versus chronological age. And we can see here we've pioneered not just where you are individually, because many companies do that, but for the first time, we're telling managers, where is their team? We're telling each member in the team that you are in, what is your collective team, your community around you, your coworkers, 
what is your health looking like overall? So this really powerful indicator, even at the company level, tells us that companies can invest in each of the different areas to bring down that health age, get younger. In the same way we're looking at the mental health scorecard, we're looking at guiding individuals on where they are with their depression, their anxiety and their stress. And if some of you saw the work that Apple is continuing to do with their work around health, you will have seen that they are now going to release their measures around this as well. And so we're really glad they're doing that because it helps everybody understand these critical factors that are affecting their life. And equally, we have measures for the team that you are in and the team that you lead. And then we are brave enough for those companies who want to know what is their company DAF score looking like. But we don't just stop there. We're starting to help employers fulfill the duty of care by signposting those people that need help confidentially, completely privately to their EAP service. So this is a new feature that we're developing to help employers fulfill their role uh, in, in the context of the responsibility to the employees. And this is um, a way to look at the dashboard view. And you can see here that we're keeping information private when necessary. It's the number one uh, priority we always have, never expose any individual data, but still provide a really powerful view of where is the company. Now this is breaking down the scores by department, but equally we can look at it from the perspective of age. We can look at it from the perspective of um, gender, and we can even look at gender by age, and we can start to understand who needs employer support the most, all confidentially. And therefore we're democratizing the reporting for employees, managers and executives. One of the biggest flaws that we found was in survey systems, we found that employers would ask employees for information only to then go and keep the information themselves and interpret what that meant. If you want behavior change, you have to equip, you have to build trust, you have to support a direct conversation with employees. So we're fulfilling that need for employees with their employees as well. Last few slides. This is a powerful new way that we have created to look at the ROI. So what do I get in return for improving my score from where I am to the 90s range? Those shape points have a value and the value of that benefit can be expressed in time and money. Now ROI is traditionally measured in, 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 in money. So we can provide that in dollar, euros, or whatever your currency happens to be. That's what employers really want to know. Is the change going to make um, a difference here to my business and what's the value going to be? But we're pioneering a new way of looking at this that if, for example, I improve the scores of my team from 63 upwards to 95, those 30 points, mean that my team can contribute another 41 weeks worth of extra value to the business that is not there today. And then we can help them pinpoint where they can do that. And this is the same way we want to start to look at the context of longevity, which is why we want to provide intelligence for every employee, the manager and the executive to boost their longevity because boosting a great experience is delivering great longevity. And that's why we are now inviting, and I would like to make this invitation to everybody here, that we would like to understand who would like to join us on a journey of developing the LCI, the Longevity Company Index. Now, I'd like to take claim to this idea, but this is not my idea, it's, a, uh, it's Anna Sepulveda's idea, but we would like to power it from shade. That are you amongst the companies that can claim that you are friendly and supporting the longevity of your employees? We believe we've got the data to measure all of that and present a single number that's going to be very powerful with many, many details underneath that support that scientifically. 
So please um, find Anna. I'm really glad that uh, Anna is there because I couldn't be there today. I'm here in the UK. But I would love to hear from you myself directly. And please uh, do take a scan if you wish to look at some of the additional work that we are doing. And perhaps we can build something together. Thank you, Paul. I'll hand back to you right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. I will ask a round of applause for this sharing. And, uh, and, and I'm sure lots of people are taking pictures and uh, and uh, so uh, quick, quick Q&A here before you depart. I have here already one question I'm going to pass. Please introduce yourself so that uh, Ali understands who is asking the question. OK, uh, my name is Anna Pina. I'm from Future Healthcare Virtual Clinic. Um, we are also developing these kind of solutions. Uh, I would like to ask you, and great presentation, by the way, um, what is your experience on the employees sharing their or doing this evaluation on the context of the company? Do they trust it? It's uh, it's a great question, Anna. Thank you very much. The you know um, the way I'm going to answer that is that we have seen um, a lot of different range of um, impact, if you like, and reactions from various organisations and, and their employees. I don't think it's about us. In um, Paul, Paul rightly called out that, that inside of AXA, if you have an AXA product and the health risk are set that employees are completing. That information is not going to their employer, it's going to AXA. AXA is then protecting that information. So we provide those risk assessment tools from an AXA perspective. Now for SHAPE, I've built exactly the same approach. And what we find is that employees mistake that it's not actually going to their employer. So what I think we've got to do is more work around educating employees that when you give us this data, like you give it to other organizations, it's about the trust that you can put in us that we will filter that information very carefully and we will provide guardianship to support you in that privacy. And this is what I call Airbnb level trust and Apple level privacy. So that's the role Shape is playing. What I mean by that is, you don't give your keys to a, a stranger without Airbnb being in the middle. That's shape. And if we can help organizations and their employees understand the role that we're playing, I think we'll have a much better successful participation, even though right now in the success levels we're finding, we're finding 97% success um, around participation in, in, in certainly the small to medium sized businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? OK, please introduce yourself to Ali Khan. Hi, Ali. My name is Ricardo Encarnação. I'm the medical director in Roche here in Portugal. I was, first of all, thank you and, and congratulations for the presentation, really clear. Um, I was wondering if you have, so one of the things I, I noticed on one of the screenshots was regarding possible actions for the employer uh, to conduct at a, a company level to improve on those on those areas so question here is do you have data and uh, on how successful implementation of those strategies are, is in terms of uh, improving those indexes afterwards and if you if the from the employee perspective if i would also receive an individual report with things that I can act personally um, um on, on my own yeah, Ricardo, thank you very much. Great question. And, and the quick answer to that is we provide over 60 level of personalized reporting and insights to each employee. And then we also go to the manager and provide them contextualized support of what they can do to support their team with the areas that they most need support in. So, the, for example, what can I do about my nutrition as an employee? What can I do as a manager for my team to support them in their nutrition? And now what can I do as an executive at policy level to support them in their nutrition? And we do the same thing across many areas like activity, like sleep, like alcohol consumption, like smoking cessation, and the list goes on. So it's 60 areas. So if you imagine there's many, many different areas. Now, does this work? 
hundred percent it does work. I'll tell you why. Because they're not areas that we have come up and said, this is what we think. What we've done is we've gone to the literature and we've gone to the behavior change expert uh, literature. So the model that we align with is called the Trans Theoretical Model of Change by James Prochaska. And this is where we are helping people move from a stage of pre-contemplation to contemplation, to preparation, action and maintenance. So we're helping them understand where they are in their journey, the role that they play and what they can do about that. And then we support them in at least understanding that. The next part of the job is that whilst we are the employee experience measurement company, there are many companies out there who are the employee experience enhancement companies. So we're starting to work with learning and development pro providers, training providers, so they can pinpoint where support is needed the most and then work on the first three to four to five areas and slowly start to expand from that. Thank you. So any more questions? I think we have time for one brief question, if there's any. If not, then a, a round of applause for the session and thank you everybody for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a lovely uh, conference together and I wish you all the success. It would be great to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, so much. And uh, now calling to Reggie to launch the video for making sure that the next uh, speakers on the roundtable please join here up front while we watch the video. Okay. And uh, thank you so much. So this is now going to going into session uh, two, uh, the round table uh, that follows the presentation from Ali Khan with uh, Juan Cordero, that is uh, the, the picture that is in this uh, slide from um, uh, Escola Nacional de Saúde Pública. We have also here with us uh, by um, order of uh, alphabetical order in the, next, in the other slide, uh, in the other slide, uh, Anna Queiroz Silva, the Silva, Director of Senior Living. Uh, she's reaching us from the UK. Anna, are you all set to speak now to intervene? I am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Anna. Uh, Good to have you on uh, on you. this hybrid meeting with us. Uh, and uh, in, there's a slide, please, so we can finalize yes, the introductions. And uh, Enric Lopes, Professor Enric Lopes, is the um, director of the Global Health Unit in Nova IMS. Uh, I met him when he was in uh, Universidad Católica already with uh, an incredible and outstanding work in uh, in public health, and so that's the reason why he's also in this panel. And uh, last but not least, uh, Diana Breda, and I'm sorry I've missed the alphabetical order, <laughs> it should be D before H. Uh, Diana Breda is uh, the, the, the CEO of Hospital Catenier. It's uh, an, an hospital that has uh, performing a leading work in um, longevity and public health, as we are going to see uh, soon in the presentations that are going to start. So we are organizing this session uh, with a series of brief presentations from each of the speakers except from Anna, that does not have a presentation, right, Anna? And yes, then, yeah, uh, we then have, um, after this round of presentations, we'll then uh, do a, a, a concentrated debate and uh, interactive uh, participation from the audience, I hope, and also in teams. Uh, so we then finalize at one o'clock for lunch, right? So without further ado, uh, Diana, please take the floor and uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. So, hi, hi everyone. As you can see, I'm not very digital because I have paper here and I have a PowerPoint. 
Uh, so my name is Diana Vreda. I'm a hospital manager uh, at a public hospital. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about the hospital, but mainly about the experience of becoming an age-friendly hospital. It is a, a very micro point of view and very, well, it's a reality. It's what we're doing right now. But it started off as a, a patient-centered digital transformation. So this is the hospital. We're the only institution uh, which is an age-friendly uh, health system participant from the Institute of Healthcare Improvements. Um, so opportunities to transform digital health, that's where we are, uh, modernizing and in trying to innovate in health units, uh, creating delivery models uh, mm -hmm. that measure health, uh, health outcomes, anticipating, anticipating health needs, mm -hmm. and promoting greater citizen participation. This is, I think, very, very important, and we're not very far ahead in Portugal on this area. Uh, and, of course, changing the financial uh, model of, um, of payment, of course. Um, some of you, I think, are going to be tomorrow and the next three days uh, on a conference, so you'll get to, uh, to learn about this Portuguese um, project experience from SPMS, so I'm not going to talk about that. That's not my role. So what we've done was we tried to, as you see, it's a small community hospital, and we've tried to promote um, digital transformation, but very much patient-centered, which I think they all should be, of course. So we've uh, understood what was our uh, hospital context, too much paper uh, and a lot of bureaucracy and poor communication between teams and units, and through digital transformation and mainly through the evaluation of the patient's pathway. We try to, we aim no paper, not me, but uh, well, the, hosp the hospital <laughs> aims no paper, and to dematerialize the clinical process, patient-centered, and very much uh, uh, managing change. And that's, I would say, as a public institution, mm -hmm. that's the hardest part. Um, so the results would be that. And the methodology that we are actually following the framework is that in an electronic medical record adoption, uh, precisely from HIMSS. So we evaluated, evaluated the, patient, the patient's uh, journey as it is through interviews, questionnaires, workshops, focus groups. I have to tell you that the process itself was um, enlightening and it was very, very different for a public hospital, as some of you Portuguese might understand. And we aim to have this broad panorama of uh, solutions um, to increase efficiency. Of course, we should, uh, health should be efficient uh, and uh, try to eliminate some obstacles. Of course, we've uh, involved all the stakeholders in this process. And uh, we did this unit mapping, every unit of the hospital, and created these personas that represented the sample. Um, we've uh, streamlined the pathway and mapped the pathway and tried to streamline it. Uh, and our critical areas of intervention was, of course, patients, but also family. That's very, 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 very important. Also because we have a palliative care unit and a staff perspective, just to go back with what Ali has said. Um, and we end cost reduction, isn't it? That's, that's how it is, Teresa, also. But now I'm going to very briefly, it's not really case studies. These are examples that came out of this process. The first one was it. we never, during the whole two years and a little bit uh, of the COVID-19 pandemia, we never uh, suspended vi visitations to our patients. And we thought that was more or less normal though we were not actually, well, the rules uh, told us to do differently, but we decided to do it this way. And we thought it was normal until we received this award from the International Hospital Federation. And then we understood it was not, uh, worldwide, it was not very usual to having done so. And technology helped a little bit here. In this age-friendly hospital, so we've, um, we come from the this um, model of the, uh, a I, A I J I, uh, and we focus on these four um, aspects: what matters, medication, mentation, and mobility. 
uh, what we do in Med I'd like to uh, just um, show you because some of you, you really don't work at hospitals, but some of you that work, this is not that difficult. We really just should uh, foc focus on, on the patients and on our case, the patients that were a really a big part of our population. So we uh, applied some scales and some detention of the 3Ds, which are dementia, depression, and uh, I, don't, um, I don't remember the other one. Uh, we collaborate with a mental health unit and we have some different projects like Yoga for All, which kind of mingle between the patients and our staff also. Um, this medication, I think this is a very serious case. Uh, well, in my setting, I, I, I won't say it's in Portugal, but we use those criteria from the American Association of Geriatrics, the BEERS criteria, and the maximum that we have actually taken out of the prescription of a patient, and these are inpatients, but it was 11 pills, 11 pills. So we find that, we're studying that very specifically, a, a, a paramount problem, because someone who is not well or uh, medicated will have less mobility and will have uh, will um, the scales the mentation scales will have worse results of course also we have a no pajama that's yoga for all we we have a no pajama policy in our hospital so we try that people don't use a pajamas we try to make it as friendly as possible. Uh, we have all that uh, fall prevention and uh, a different uh, uh, signaling uh, signalage of the building itself. Uh, even the letters are of a certain type so that everyone can understand them. Understand them. And this is my thing, it's motivation, what matters. Um, we try to promote social interaction and that has something to do with this enc encouraging visits. Now we have, I have to say we have to have some kind of schedule of the visitations but we really do not practice it we try of course there are sometimes the people uh, the patients get tired and we try to be uh, attentive to that but they can i would say almost freely go through the hospital mainly on the outside areas where we really want people that can do can do that to go uh, before someone is sent home we go to their home and try to understand what would be possible for to to do that it's like you have to have a new shower and, and that kind of very basic and simple things uh, but that can provide a hurly, a hurlier, hurlier this this start this charge uh, protocols with schools that's their cooking and that's what that was on Christmas we also have well a, a lot of um, um, students that go there and to me uh, it's very as a manager is very interesting to see that the students they get to we have wonderful letters that they write to us and say that was a very intense and fulfilling experience. We love that very much to our community. To, we feel we should do that with the community. So we try to this budget positive aging communication and some health uh, literacy with help of Anas Puvdara. That's why I'm here also. Oh, this was a, we had a, that's a, an influencer. You were talking about this earlier, this person here in black. Uh, and shining, um, and she wrote a book, and we've presented the book because it was about aging in general, and we've presented the book on our uh, hospital also. So you see, you have young people going there now; they're painting their nails. We have musicians, and we really are proud to say that we try very hardly to engage our uh, society, civil society. We promote volunteer problem programs um, amongst of course, young people, but also amongst, for example, our retired uh, people that retire from the hospital. And that's have, it's for, important for them to kind of still feel to the hospital where they've learned, where they've lived for, um, worked for, let's say, 30 years. Community outreach, this is, we have also pet uh, friendly, visit, they can um, visit their uh, owners where, if they're in the in ward. So this satisfaction survey, which is really our biggest recognition, I would, this is in Portuguese, so that you'll learn a little bit also. Respeito um, means respect. And well, I'm very proud of that one because uh, maybe we're sometimes giving 
too much technology. This is not very politically correct, but that's how it is. And what people feel is that we don't respect them. And that is the, the scope that people uh, we really should refocus on that also. We'll have some prices. Um, and just a very short example, community diagnosed services at proximity care units. We did some focus groups and understood that exams were one, uh, exam availability was one of the big problems in that area. So we talked to the, um, to the, uh, the patients also, to the community to understand that, and to the primary care units. And this team, radiologist, doctor, lab and EG, uh, it's ECG tech technicians, they go to the um, third sector unit uh, organizations for the elderly um, and to the primary care units in cooperation with the municipality of Cantanied. It's a, an example of integrated care. And we provide, provide those uh, services nearby the people's, the person, where, where people live, mostly to person, people who are or either aged or and have uh, mobility problems also. And we had these results of uh, rapid referral and a very important one. We also reduced the carbon front uh, footprint and we've studied that, but we've avoided that people went to the e um, which is a major problem uh, in Portugal. And we have this quick wins, a very good, again, <laughs> patient experience and uh, and you've talked to the, about that on the early se session, creating a bond of trust. We are there to help them. We are there to help the third uh, sector organizations, uh, to, not to help, to work with them, to cooperate. Um, and do we do with the primary care units and with the, in 11 residences? And so that's it. Sometimes it does not take genius. It takes diligence and moral clarity. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as, as agreed, let's start now with the next presentation and then in the end we collapse the questions and uh, we make a conversation before we go to lunch. So next in conversation after uh, looking at uh, the practical reality of um, a community hospital here in Cantanied, we are uh, now taking um, a more systemic view on, on the issue at table here with uh, the presentation from uh, Professor João Cordeiro from the Escola Nacional de Saúde Pública. He's, he has Just prepared a nice presentation for us. You have the floor, you have a microphone. That sound okay? Is it working at home? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, let me start by thanking the organization for the opportunity to speak here on such an interesting topic and to share the floor with my colleagues here. And I'll talk on a slightly different uh, subject. I'm uh, uh, working at the National School of Public Health at North Nova University on health law and ethics. And I will uh, talk very briefly on the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And by the way, let me, let me start this, I forgot. Um, about uh, ethical, legal and social challenges at, that lie at the intersection of public health longevity and digital innovation. And uh, at the core, I guess, at the core of the um, very short talk that I'm about to give uh, lies uh, the human interaction that we have with time. Uh, what is the impact of time on our health? How much of it do we get? How much of it? How can we make better use of it? Uh, and this, uh, we can look at it from very different perspectives, from a very individual one, or from a global one. And if we look, we can select different data sources, of course, but the trend is more or less uh, the same. As time goes by in the last decades, we have made uh, incredible gains in terms of longevity, uh, even for the less optimistic. So when we look at these curves, there's a general trend, which is an optimistic trend. Of course, there's variations and inequality in our world, but globally, we have made impressive gains, mainly due to public health advances, like the development of antibiotics and vaccines, but also due to the capacity of technology and digital innovation to increase improvements or to uh, include improvements in our uh, daily lives, leading edge technologies, etc. Regarding aging specifically, uh, we, this is a very famous paper uh, entitled The Hallmarks of Ag uh, Aging that draws parallel from a very famous paper, even more famous paper from the 90s in the previous century 
uh, titled uh, The Hallmarks of Cancer. And it's just, it's just here to briefly illustrate that aging from a biological perspective is a multifactorial process. Um, it has, well, increasingly being uh, better studied than understood. And what these authors did, and this is the 10th anniversary of this uh, seminal paper, there's uh, the All Marks of Aging 2023 coming up, or already around the corner, uh, is to uh, provide us with strategies to try and counteract some of these effects, uh, biological effects uh, of aging. And this can be uh, introduced at many different levels that we don't have time here to explore. Of course, uh, other, uh, let's call it, I don't know, initiatives, um, have been around for a while, some with more maybe ambitious uh, goals to undo aging altogether. This is the, one of the most famous uh, foundations around SANS, which stands for Strategies to Enhance Negligible Senescence. It's quite a complicated uh, name from Aubrey de Grey. Um, the Longevity Fund and different companies tackling aging and trying to uh, revert the biological impact of time. Um, now, this intersection between public health that we've just seen, digital innovation and longevity raises uh, compelling ethical, legal and social challenges. This would justify much more time of discussion, of course. And here we're just, in a nutshell, highlighting a few. And I guess the main message is, I'm, I'm a techno-optimist. Some people are not. Obviously, there's techno-pessimists and even uh, more extreme versions of it, both on the optimistic side and on the pessimistic side. But uh, so I... I believe that digital innovation can be an ally to address some of these ethical, legal and social challenges. But we need to keep uh, our eyes open and we need to stay aware to what these challenges are, because this obviously can get out of hand. Over overpopulation being one of them. Of course, if we live longer and resources are limited, we will have a hard time distributing these resources uh, you know, in a fair uh, manner. Justice, distributing benefits, benefits costs, and costs, not just uh, economic costs. Uh, and by the way, some of these costs are actually related with suffering, and uh, which in the healthcare sector is very uh, important and uh, very difficult to translate into data. We cannot really measure, or it's very difficult to measure uh, suffering and individual suffering, even collective suffering and organizational uh, one, or empathy or compassion. This is very difficult to translate, if not impossible to translate into data. Um, a reshaping that we are going through of identity and our uh, relationship with technology. The borders of our relationship with technology are moving. Uh, it is becoming different what it is to be human. We interact in digital spaces and this has an impact on our own nature, of course. Uh, an exacerbation of the classical data ethics issues, privacy, security, ownership. Um, so all these can uh, find answers in digital innovation, of course. As we give more and more space to machines and algorithms and AI to make decisions for us, and this is immensely important in the healthcare space, of course, the, some of these decisions involve an ethical and a moral dimension. So we need to find a way to uh, get some balance here and maybe even uh, formulate and code some uh, very important ethical values onto the development of these algorithms and systems, the so-called ethics by design. Uh, reshaping of uh, values, values that have been shown to be very important in the uh, health area, discernment, trustworthiness. We spoke uh, a lot about uh, some of these values in the previous uh, two talks. Uh, very important on when we talk about aging, stigmatization and exclusion. The final moments of our lives sometimes are related with violence, with neglect. Uh, and uh, obviously we need to find the proper tools to uh, ameliorate the suffering that comes along with this situation and a, a, a classical one, medicalization of that. Now the bad news. Um, the bad news is uh, the more we move towards 100 years of age, the more likely it is uh, that we die. So uh, it approaches 100%. Now this notion of trying to tackle this and change it somehow has pervaded art for a long time. We have this in the literature, and here's an example of uh, José Saramago's novel, Death with Interruptions, where death just stops killing and then society evolves from there. Uh, in paintings, 
we see it everywhere, the fountain of youth. So we come along rejuvenated from the other side of uh, this bath. Um, and there's even in the Greek mythology, this mythology of Tithonus, like a capital punish punishment to live eternally, but as an old person. Now, if we start perceiving age as punishment or as disease, uh, we can maybe run into problems, ethical, legal, and social problems, of course, human problems. Now, there's also a technological or digital, if we will, version of this discussion, more contemporary, um, related with the transhumanist movement that has, like, at the extreme, the idea of longevity, not from a biological standpoint, but from a digital one meaning that we maybe in the future can upload our conscience onto a computer and be able to live uh, eternally. Now, uh, this notion has made strides. Some companies have uh, dedicated themselves uh, to this. Some have forged very relevant uh, collaborations with members of the academic uh, community. Here's a big example from a few years ago, a 100% fatal business, uh, according to the words of the company itself. So after uh, dying, the company uh, tried to digitalize uh, human conscience. Um, and there's more, even more egotistical, let's say, projects, uh, like the 2045 project. I don't know if you've come along uh, this project in any way, starting by building a robotic copy of ourselves and finishing with an avatar and th that has a digital uh, conscience. The bionic, uh, let's call it bionic man, that's the title of these uh, shows, uh, that can be found in different museums throughout the world, the Smithsonian in Washington, the London Science Museum, etc. It's like this entity with synthetic parts, organs, uh, circulatory system, lymphatic system, a computer for a brain that interacts uh, with human beings. Now, this is starting to get a bit dystopian, I know, but uh, I'm just pushing the argument to the extreme so that we focus on what is essential. And what's essential is that we, time has an impact on our lives, we age, that brings uh, some um, difficulties with it, but also some uh, relevant points. And as I said before, if we start uh, looking at this process as a process that um, needs to be counteracted. And if we start looking at aging merely as a disease, uh, this will raise issues that uh, even the best technology might not be able uh, to solve. And I'll finish with a very uh, brief reflection on the following. This is a painting from uh, Edward Munch, famous painter, uh, I'm mispronouncing his name, surely, uh, called Death in the Sick Room. And what we see in this painting is uh, someone who's lying on that bed there that is about to pass away. Uh, living the final moments uh, of uh, his or her life. And what we see in this uh, room is a room that is, of course, filled with sadness. But there's a human link that connects every human being that is inside this room. There's an environment of comfort and warmth inside this room. Many times these days, we see people uh, living their final moments on the planet surrounded by the fanciest of technology and digital innovation, but alone. Even to a point when external circumstances forced us, like the pandemic that we've just been through, to uh, call on our human creativity to provide some uh, human touch uh, whenever that human touch is impossible uh, to provide due uh, to distancing uh, measures. Now, if technology and innovation can assist us in focusing on what is essential. And it can do that. It should do that because it's at our service, of course, to focus on what we are better at, which is to care for one another and then achieve longevity throughout different generations as a species. Uh, I guess we will surely will have a, a better world. So it's an optimistic uh, note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a lovely picture to finish the presentation. And now that we are looking at this global picture, we are going to have a, a presentation from a global uh, case uh, presented by Enrique Lopes. He's, he's the current director of global health in the Nova IMS. Enrique, the floor is all yours. You have the mic there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, 
for changing the Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to present you uh, a project that we have in the center in uh, some European countries uh, about uh, flu vaccination. And uh, as you maybe know, uh, the main target of uh, flu vaccination is people uh, with more than 65 plus. So let's see what we are done. Uh, first, the, the, the disclaimer. But uh, nothing new uh, about the 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 flu. The flu. We lived a pandemic recently, as everybody knows. But the big threat that we have in the landscape, in public health terms, is flu. There are some strains of flu very near uh, to come and with uh, pandemic potential. So uh, WHO and the European Council developed this program for uh, uh, attaining the 75 percent of VCR, VCR is vaccine coverage rate, uh, 75 percent of population risk population covered by uh, influenza vaccination uh, till uh, 2030. One important issue related with flu is uh, when we think specifically we in people with 65 plus 90% of deaths are inside this demographic group. 50 to 70% of all hospitalizations and uh, respective costs related are uh, from dead people. And we can spoke more other issues related uh, with vaccination. For example, cardiac, cardiovascular diseases related as a consequence of uh, flu. Very recently, uh, it was identified that when people with the 65 plus are vaccinated with the flu vac vaccine, can have a reduction in Alzheimer and other dementia disease till a maximum of 40 percent. So when we spoke about uh, uh, flu vaccination, we do not speak specifically on flu, but we speak with many other issues as dementia, as cardiovascular diseases, as uh, hospital costs. So for this, we developed um, a game, a gamification uh, tool, um, because our target is not necessarily, naturally in the last step, it will be the, the people, but our first target are not the vaccinated person, but those that define the policies inside each country. So. Health policy makers is the main target. And why? Because more than half of health decision makers are not from health fields because they came from political approach. And it's natural. No problem with that. But we need to understand that lawyers, economists, and many other professions arrive to the politics and then arrive to decision making in health. And they decide politically, not technically. So we need to provide frameworks, tools, for that can have a decision making based in evidence based uh, approach. So our first target is uh, policymakers. That's why we, we made the European project for uh, hepatitis C elimination um, uh, in between 2015 and 2020. We made for 12 countries in Europe and our first target was the parliament. And we made, to, we developed the tool and we presented, we discussed and we could change the policies in at least, as far as I know, four countries in Europe. And that's why we are, we, I will go to the European, uh, to the, sorry, to the Swedish Parliament in year, by the end of the year to the European Parliament too, for discussing this because our target is not only national uh, policymakers, but European policymakers uh, too. Second, regional and local uh, authorities. More and more people from uh, regions and the, the Europe, the European Union is transforming very quickly from a nation's club to a regions club. We have 27 member, uh, country members, but we have 
420 regions with huge um, capacity of decision making, especially in health. So we target two regional and local authorities. Key opinion leaders. Uh, very important because many of them out of the uh, health fields, but they are very important as it was shown during pandemic. The most effective people in spreading good information, it was the peers, namely among vulnerable groups. For example, in migrants, community leaders are much more efficient uh, than uh, health authorities. Who uh, advocates patients? and natural, the general public. Why gamification? And what is the limit of gamification? The, the main risk in this target is to believe that a gamification tool is a kind of oracle, is not. It's a set of situation. For example, I can give you a very quick example. During 75 years, Sweden do not want to come to, to NATO. With the Ukrainian war in three weeks, 80% of Swedish people be, want to become to NATO. So the gamification tools works if the context do not change a lot. It's just enough to have a critical issue and all the game is changed. So this is an ethical disclaimer that I must to do and uh, to alert when I spoke to the to the our targets to the to the people that we address is always something that I strongly reinforce that gamification is a science based uh, tool, but not an oracle. And depends a lot of the ecosystem. <coughs> but more than explain how this works, we have produced a, a, a short video that can uh, show you what and how works this tool. LCF is a high-grade online digital tool to support public health policy decision-making towards increasing influenza vaccination coverage rates, VCR, to at least 75% in new countries. The effectiveness of influenza vaccination is estimated between 40 to 60% to reduce the risk of developing flu illness in the general population. The LCF tool is based on 13 policies extracted from the Cassianos model, corresponding to its five pillars, health authority accountability, facilitated access to vaccination, healthcare professional accountability and engagement, awareness of the burden and severity of the disease, belief in influenza vaccination benefits. There are several stakeholders identified in the project, the main targets being PHP decision makers, such as health authorities and health related politicians, NGOs and influenza patient associations. The complementary targets are the general population. The tool aims to help flu related stakeholders better understand how different public health policy decisions may affect the epidemics of influenza in selected countries in a 10 year span. It is built by layers of knowledge about influenza, which means it remains user friendly for everyone from regular citizens to specialists in the field. The pilot phase of the LCF project consisted of its application to Sweden and demonstrated a successful implementation that carefully considered the nation's unique context and realities. The LCF project is now in its second phase, expanding to some European countries, beginning with Italy and Czechia. National advisory Germany. boards are being established in each country to ensure the highest accuracy and validity. Consisting of epidemiology and health system experts, these boards are tasked with carefully monitoring and validating the results obtained. The LCF tool empowers patients' advocacy and PHP decision-making by allowing them to create epidemiological scenarios in a gamified manner, ultimately being an empowerment tool for health democracy. This research receives funding from the pharmaceutical industry through Sanofi. The research is completely independent from the funding sponsoring. The first phase of this project was developed in the public health unit of the Institute of Health Sciences of the Catholic University of Portugal. It's the same team that we change all together to the Nova University. And it, then you can make the download of the app here, just photo the, the QR code if you want, and you can test. And this is very important. Citizenship in, in health is very, is very based in our personal experience. We need to test. And 
when we claim about something, we should claim in an evidence-based approach. When we demand action from the politicians, from health authorities, we should negotiate under science-based approach. And this kind of tools, that is what it uh, provides to us the possibility to have a, 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 a evidence-based citizenship in health. Why this is so important for longevity discussion? Because we can enroll and explain properly what is flu vaccination for the decision makers, for those that advocate uh, aging uh, in the perspective of uh, families and patients, for the citizen that want to know more about the risks and uh, advantage to, to make a, a flu vaccination. And because we have a tool that could be self-explained and have layers of explanation. In other words, if um, imagine that in a um, health or university, they want to discuss this. They can have a very basic approach, very, very simple very natural language. But if they are professionals, they can click in the high that each field has and to have a technical explanation. And if they are uh, decision makers, scientists, etc., they can even to, uh, to, 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 to read, to consult the bibliographic references that support each of the, the, the fields. So this democratic approach, political approach, science approach, all together in one uh, gamification can provide not only more longevity because people do not die so much. It's around 3 million deaths per year and we can avoid at least enough. And much more important, from my personal perspective, much more important than huge longevity years with quality of life because people do not become sicker do not go to the hospital and can even if they remain with the same years years with more health that is so important thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh, well what uh, bunch of presentations we have here too much information maybe to absorb maybe not so uh, let's open the floor now to the participants in the room and also on Teams. Uh, I will try to monitor both and make sure everybody has the chance to start the conversation now here with the, uh, our guest speakers that have uh, done so much and sharing today with us. So I see a hand here in the audience. Make sure you introduce yourself to the ones who are on the Oh, and of course, uh, and, and uh, we have still an intervention from our guest speaker, Anna Queiroz da Silva from Senior Living. And perhaps you could do the first comment on these presentations. And uh, would that be OK? Sure. Yes, and then we we'll open, the yes. we'll open the floor here. Yeah, OK. So, thank you. Okay. Um, would you like me to comment on the three presentations or say something about them? Is that what you are asking that me to do? That will be amazing. And if you could do uh, some uh, thing that connect them all and then launch the conversation here with the audience. OK, well, um, congratulations on the pilot in um, the hospital. That was fantastic. Um, it is very similar to what the NHS is doing here in the uh, in the UK. Um, and I think the three of them do connect because it has to do with, um, especially the second speaker, with caring and humanity and how we humanitize uh, technology with people. And then the third one as well is how we increase longevity by helping people to trust in um, medicine. So I think the three connect very well because they have um, digital um, and technology that connect the three of them, but they don't forget the um, humane part of, of um, caring for people and in healthcare. And that's my comment. I open it to the floor. Thank you so much, Anna, for brevity. And now we can launch a conversation, Neil, and stay in the screen so you can also uh, keep uh, talking with us. 
Hi, um, I'm David McBully, a uh, lab to market. I work with startups and um, innovation. Um, I have a question that popped to my mind because of uh, what Juan said and because of Dan as an example. Uh, and um, I'm curious to know practically how what happens and how often it might happen, which is Jean mentioned in your last days, minutes of life, you have, you're surrounded with technology, but then there's no human touch or presence or sometimes. And it's always hard to bring your family to the hospital in the last few days and actually the other way around. So I was wondering, Diana, in your experience, how many patients end up asking to go home in the last few days? How does it work? Is it feasible? Because you are a public hospital, right? So how does it really work? And we are surrounded by a lot of technology, even startups here who can complement a little bit that last few days at home if needed. So I'm very curious on knowing what really happens. Well, every case, uh, it's a different case. <clears throat> um, sometimes people are uh, asked to go home, but sometimes they don't. And sometimes, and that was kind of a surprise for me. We've, we've kept just, uh, I'll get there. We kept the registrations for the visiting, uh, for the people uh, uh, visiting because people do not want to see some of their relatives. That was very shocking to me, but I had to accept it. Um, and that's why we keep uh, people still enrolled to, to, visit, to visit our patients. To uh, uh, provide, uh, provide assistance at, at home. Sometimes people feel comfortable. It's a calm rural environment. And we facilitate, I, I think we had, there was a, a Brazilian um, young person uh, and their, uh, the mother, she lived with us basically for more than one month. Sorry, if you can speak a little bit I'm louder sorry. for the team's participants to listen and also Anna. So, yeah, that's it. Now, I, I'm glad they, they haven't uh, heard it at home because maybe I'll get fired after that, but that's what we've done, yes. But it would be very interesting for us as a public entity to actually could um, use another digital tools that would provide us to do that too, with the same team to a much larger uh, part of the population, of course. Anyone else would like to comment this question in the panel? I can just add uh, one quick uh, note to what I was, can you hear? Is this okay? Um, to what I said before. Uh, in fact, uh, and adding on to, to what you just said, uh, in fact, there's some interesting, uh, I shouldn't say experiments, but uh, evidence coming from uh, other, other parts of the world, not to say that it wouldn't hold true here, of people living their later years where they actually don't want uh, uh, contact, not only don't want contact with family members, of course, this is individual circumstances that vary, but they feel very comfortable around machines, say robots, for example. And when a robot, uh, you know, miss works, so st stops working, uh, people miss it. And they miss that robot, not a different robot that comes along to substitute it. So that there's, we tend to form these emotional connections with who, not, I cannot say whoever now, but whatever is taking care, involved, in our own care. So uh, again, there's space there for machines as well. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, and, and I know that there's a very interesting work being done uh, to improve life at those stages. So yeah, another re reason to be optimistic, I think. Any more interventions from the panel or the speakers or the participants? Can I just comment how the NHS? Sure. Yeah, because sure. we have lots of we have we have many um, po uh, different populations here. So um, we have um, a lot of people are migrants and so do not have family in the UK. And um, so they, especially now with COVID, they've used a lot, especially end of of life care, and they they have a lot of um, people that they train either healthcare or not to be with that person because that person doesn't have family here so that somebody will always be with them and it's normally not a machine but a human and they look in before they leave this world okay uh, a question for thank you thank you anna okay no I, 
uh, I would like to ask a question to Professor uh, Eric. Um, we are talking about uh, the life expectancy um, that is around eight years uh, here in Portugal and in Iberia, but the healthy life is 15 to 20 years less. Um, and one of the main reasons are non-communicable diseases for sure. How do you see these kinds of projects that you are uh, doing um, could help uh, increase the LC life and not only the, are you doing something about it? Quality and LC life years, because LC life years are 15 to 20 years less and aging is like a physiological process that we all have since we are born. So, yes, the first determinant of uh, the number of healthy years is literacy. And the second is uh, social determinants, especially in women. For example, there are a, a very um, canonic study made in Netherlands that show a woman that, um, and I, I have in my computer if you want to see uh, this study, I think. Um, if a woman has only primary school, has 11 years difference of healthy life from another woman from the same city uh, with an um, uh, academic degree. So we are living with very um, short time in the uh, health years because we are the 53 in 20 in 53 countries in Europe. We have the lowest level of literacy in average. So this is the first determinant and we can only change if, if we change the literacy of the country. Um, second, uh, the social determinants. Uh, the, 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 the poverty, the, the number uh, of people living in the vulnerable groups in the country is another uh, major uh, impact. So uh, much more than the fancy computers and uh, machines, I should remember a very, a very good sketch of Monty Python in 83, uh, uh, the meaning of life, where uh, a woman delivery, surrounding of all machines that you can imagine, uh, but uh, in public health, much more than this fancy technology, soap and water is the major determinant. Good food, good water, uh, good healthy lifestyles, and you can change around 20 to 30 years in the life expectancy and especially in the healthy years. All medicines we have, all technology together is a difference of around 10 years. So in Portugal specifically, we have huge, uh, a huge path to fulfill, especially because our elder persons, they live in a time that if they made four years of school, it's enough. It was not because they are, they don't have capacity. It was enough. It was expected that people made 40 years, four years only. At the same time, I should remember that uh, Norway uh, extinguished uh, uh, analphabetism in 1840. And uh, in Europe, the 11, uh, 11 year of uh, scholarity, it was applied in the 20s of the last century. So we have a huge difference that uh, the, the one of the reflex is the more years with health, uh, with, uh, without, without health, sorry. And only change this. Maybe uh, University for Health can change a lot. Uh, if the communication of health authority change completely, because um, um, even the tools for measuring uh, health literacy uh, in uh, elder people here exclude most of the of the our uh, elder persons. Uh, 
more more questions from the audience i think ricardo and then yeah. but uh just can you uh, introduce yourself sorry for the speak the viewers in teams they have to uh, my name is Isa Gudo. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, a medical. I'm an inter internal medicine physician. I went to your, <laughs> you, yeah. I had the pleasure to have uh, Professor João to be my uh, professor in Nova IMS in your postgraduate program, and I al always like uh, his presentations that are always very. Um, how can I say it? it's very, uh, yeah, <laughs> inspired, but it, it, it's provocative. It's the, but my, it's just a commentary of the healthy years. Um, of course, uh, I agree with you, Professor, but um, it's because we are poor. Our GDP is the worst, and our the percentage of G GDP allocated to healthcare and uh, social. Um, uh, it's uh, very, very. Uh, it's we can take from education and put it in, in healthcare or put it in social uh, social security, and. Uh, it, it is a very, very uh, few, um, very few money to treat and to give all those, uh, uh, all those plus 75, uh, 65 or to uh, promote uh, healthy habits of life. They like promote exercise, like promote uh, um, other activities that that uh, make those people healthier they only live with i i don't know i'm just saying imagine 200 heroes uh, per month they can only buy the medication and eat what they can and of course i think and now we are living with a more um with the gen uh, generation that has more literacy in Portugal, and we are seeing how the younger are, are living. They are living worse that, that, uh, than they, they, their parents. They are immigrating, they are... I think this is a very... Um, I'm, <laughs> it's a very... Uh, not... Um, it's an issue that it <laughs> can, can cause uh, many discussions, but I think literacy is important, but we are seeing now that our younger population with the uh, very good, uh, with the more, uh, the major lev uh, level of literacy are uh, not, uh, living worse than their parents and the the, the early, uh, earlier generations, and uh, we are poor and we have a very, very, <laughs> Our, 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 and I think it, it is the the main reason that our the holder doesn't live well. We don't have many many things to. I don't know. I do not fully agree with you. And why? First, we are the fourth more efficient uh, health system in Europe because we work cheap and we have good. Uh, very good performance. Uh, I can show you a very recent one week uh, map that put the expense in health and life expectancy. And we became the fourth more efficient in, in, not, in not only Europe, in uh, uh, Western countries. The, wor the worst is the United States. Second, uh, uh, the the one thing is non-healthy lifestyles, and is one of the one of the the reasons because people become sick. But uh, in uh, terms of expectancy, is literacy between de depend of the country between uh, five to eleven years difference. And uh, for example, when you improve very basically, I had project in, in Africa that uh, when we gave uh, very, I, I, I give you an, uh, a practical example, a, a project in, in uh, Guinea-Bissau Islands, Bijagos, uh, when we promoted uh, oral health 
in two years, just because we improve literacy, health literacy, the kids became with the equivalent level of European kids. So, is uh, direct. Uh, another thing is natural. There are new risks uh, in lifestyles, uh, but uh, is not in terms of deadly rates. But by the contrary, by the contrary, is decreasing uh, the, the the taxes. Our problem is just a personal perspective, and I'm not. If I'm correct, it's my point of view. My 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 interpretation of our problem is that because we have 98.5 for curative health and 1.5 for preventive health. And inside this 1.5%, we need to put all the salaries of the general direction of health. We need to put all expenses with vaccination. It is very, very high. Um, and these natural expenses is not a criticism is when we from this 1.5 percent we put out these two main uh, expenses in reality our preventive uh, health is 0 0.2 in other words we expand in the curative or pre-preventive issues 99.8 percent and this is wrong this, this is wrong we need to change a lot of this and we need to use, for example, the city of Suwon in South Korea is the most advanced city in the world. They, they, it's very near Seoul, uh, medium-sized city. They create what they name it, uh, knowledge centers, uh, spread all over the, the, the city uh, in a way that nobody lives more than 10 minutes walking from a knowledge center. And this, in this knowledge, this is not only for health, but it's basically for health. Um, people go, people live, people, people. For example, I, I, I saw a very interesting, uh, original, but interesting uh, ballet show with uh, ladies with more than 85 years old. What is surprising? 85 years old, and they, they have a group of ballet, classical ballet. Very easy movements, natural, but they have. And they changed, and that's why they, ha they are the first city in the world, because they put all. But we can see other, other examples. For example, in Bolivia, in, um, in the capital of Bolivia, they change the paradigm of health, not using professionals from health, but using local authorities to change in municipal plans of health. The same approach in uh, Mexico City. Uh, by the way, for example, in Cork, in uh, in Ireland, they have a different approach. They put together not only the local municip uh, municipal authorities, but uh, working with the local health uh, professionals, and they have a, an amazing, amazing program for health persons, as well uh, in Oslo. So, one best solution. Is is not real. Uh, is not credible. We don't. We cannot put all eggs in same basket. We know by uh, from the theory that the first determinant of health is literacy. The second is social determinants. The third is the health conditions. And we need to to manage the health ecosystem all together with all the tools, with all social actors, and. Uh, Especially do, in health, we have we are very arrogant. Usually, we are we are very arrogant. We speak with patients from one high position to a lower position. In general, yeah, you know, just in 1958, it was forbidden by the medical association the order, to do that. The physician do not treat by two the the, the patients. Is not 100 years ago, uh, but uh, we need to put out this ivory tower and to speak peer to peer with local uh, authorities, with national authorities, with uh, patients association, with the patients in general, etc. 
Okay, okay. We are approaching critical time, one o'clock, and I have to ask if you would like to have a little bit more food for thought or food for the stomach. Can I mention something uh, just to add on to what the gentleman uh, just said? Absolutely, Anna. Make yes. this an hybrid, truly hybrid meeting, please. Okay. Um, to I, I agree in part to what the um, doctor was saying about um, a lot of the Portuguese have migrated, especially the the young people. Um, and um, but I live in the UK and I work in the in the healthcare sector here. Um, and what they have done. Uh, their policies have been around pharmacists and pharmacists have become prescribers and have doctors and they, the doctors, as you say, are in um, are not accessible. So they have um, used community pharmacists and have um, trained them uh, to become clinicians. And to um, this year, it will start where community pharmacists will actually be able to prescribe. Um, they really are independent prescribers. They um, they learn how to um, uh, one uh, one system, or they work together with GPs. And the next step that they're going to do is actually the NHS is working with the private sector and with pharmacies and doctors and hospitals, and they're all going to integrate into one system. So that um, if I'm a pharmacist in a community pharmacy, I can consult with someone and I will have access to that patient's full records, which at the minute they don't. Um, and so they base their clinical decisions in pharmacy on what the patient has just told them at that time. So what the NHS is doing here is they're joining, they're connecting all the dots basically, but using technology. And they also are using patients to help themselves by using by having doctors online and by using their app, which is the NHS app. And if a patient is elderly and does not know how to use technology, they will contact the regional team or the regional GPs will actually get together and they will teach the patients. And if they can't still get, uh, be digitally um, uh, well trained, then they can still phone the GP or just go to the to the, the sorry the GP is the doctor here it's called the general prescriber so they are moving but they're not doing a lot on preventative and they've only started this year doing preventative measures so I agree with you that we're not investing enough in preventative although the 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 private sector here has been in the last years and only the, the currently this year the government has realized and they are investing um if I'm not, I think I'm at 654 million in the healthcare sector this year to to help so that we can lower, so that they can lower diabetes and, and heart conditions and increase longevity of their population. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have to start thinking about moving because the lunch is waiting for us right now. For all the ones who've registered lunch, please stay here. We give you further instructions. But I would hate to leave this wonderful session without asking each of our guest speakers and perhaps starting with Sarah with golden nugget from what we have all witnessed here uh, in this uh, second part of the market morning. Uh, what will be, you know, the takeaway from these uh, conversations and these presentations? And starting by uh, Sarah, then John, then uh, Anna, and finally Enrique last one to speak, he was also the last to present. I think Anna got it. The human factor is very, very important. Louder. The human factor is very important. Uh, you should do it with patients and working with them. You should not take decisions for them. That's really very important. And I do think we're still very paternalistic, yes. Um, and so engage them and trying to understand which technology. But we're all, I, I wanted to give you just a a little bit of hope. We're also doing that very, uh, but we're also doing that at Balkan SNS, working with patients um, uh, for in tele, tele consultations, for example, with patients uh, in their neighborhoods. Um, again, and just about, I do think we have, a, we really, uh, as Portuguese uh, society, we should really go back to uh, in certain ways, not to uh, not knowing how to read and to poverty, but to that society feeling and with compassive neighborhoods, which is very trendy now in Europe. But I think we were that before and we really should go back to that and 
very much using digital, digitalization if that helps us to talk to our grandson, which is in the UK working as a doctor. Thank you so much, Diana. And so I apologize, I called you Sarah in the a few minutes ago. It's Diana Breda. Thank you so much for your golden nugget and for your sharing of thoughts. Sure. Uh, very briefly, uh, the challenges tend to increase. It, the world is getting more complex. It's also getting more complex in the health sector, as we can uh, as we can see. And uh, if we live in a world where some parts of it are chasing the la latest technology gadget, and in other parts of the world still looking for water to drink and food to have, if I think we need to keep our eyes on the ball, focus on what's important, and uh, use technology because technology can in fact be the vehicle through which we can solve some of these problems, but not uh, work at it the other way around and be uh, sort of instrumentalized by it, but use it as a tool to solve some of the most pressing issues, which are different from country to country, of course, and we have our own here in Portugal, of course. Yeah. Anna, any last thoughts before I give the floor to Enric to close? Yes. Um, as a Portuguese and as a director of a company where um, the foreigners want to come to Portugal to have a healthy lifestyle, and leave their countries, which are normally America, Canada, the most advanced countries, but they would like, and they do, because I'm, I'm, that's why I have a company called Senior Living Villages. Um, they want to live in Portugal and Spain, and they feel that they have longevity in these countries. So as Portuguese and Spanish, we should think about why are they coming to us and we are going elsewhere. That's all. Thank you for sharing that. And Rick, over to you. I think in the next 15 years, we go to to live a change of paradigm. Uh, last month, WHO uh, defined the new concept of permacrisis. That means we go to live permanently in the health crisis, energy crisis, financial crisis, etc. And we need to adapt. That means in health, we need to dispute much more the, the money. Uh, we go to have technology as, as never it happened in the humanity. And we need to integrate all of this in the new ecosystem uh, of uh, health in, healthcare providing. Um, and we need to adapt uh, completely because if we do not make our homework, we develop uh, a new solution of two paradigms, the rich and the poor. For, and uh, this is enough do not uh, take the problem of info exclusion. So the new paradigm, paradigm should incorporate uh, info inclusion for all, and this is to be done, namely in Portugal. Thank you so much. And I think a round of applause for this wonderful conversation we just had here. It was truly, truly inspiring for me. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Anna, for yeah. joining from the UK. Thank you, teams, Thank participants, you uh, remotely. It was a pleasure. Uh, I see also George Matthews, uh, advisory board member from the US, joining us in Teams. Thank you so much, participants, for your great questions and interaction that was created here. We look forward more of that in the afternoon. And right now, for the ones who uh, are waiting for instructions on lunch, uh, maybe we can start a video with our thanks Artly thanks to our sponsors. And then, Pedro, please come and make the instructions for the floor. Video now. O acesso a cuidados de saúde de qualidade e a melhores condições de vida e bem-estar é um dos aspectos mais importantes na vida de cada um de nós. Consciente dos novos desafios que se colocam a cada momento, na prestação destes cuidados de saúde, 
Nasce em 2003 o grupo Future Healthcare, um grupo internacional privado, independente e especializado na gestão dos seguros de saúde e vida. Ao longo das últimas duas décadas, alinhamos as nossas competências, desenvolvemos produtos e serviços inovadores e competitivos, através de um ecossistema digital abrangente que liga cliente final, prestador de serviços médicos e cliente corporativo. Sempre com o mesmo propósito, oferecer a melhor proposta e valor aos nossos clientes e aos nossos prestadores de serviços médicos. Proporcionar aos nossos clientes as melhores condições de saúde, vida e bem-estar é a missão da Future Healthcare. Foi também por isso que em 2020 decidimos criar a Future Healthcare Virtual Clinic, uma unidade de telemedicina que alia a componente clínica e tecnológica numa plataforma digital e integrada para ligar as pessoas aos cuidados de saúde adequados, quando e onde for necessário. Na plataforma da Future Healthcare Virtual Clinic é possível realizar todo o processo clínico, do agendamento da consulta pelo cliente até à realização da videoconsulta com prescrição de exames e receitas médicas de forma segura e 100% online. Um serviço prestado por médicos de diferentes especialidades e profissionais de saúde, de modo integrado e centrado no cliente, com níveis de acompanhamento distintos. Hoje, duas décadas depois do seu nascimento, mas com a mesma ambição de sempre, a Future Healthcare continua a inovar com o lançamento da observação médica remota, uma nova geração no ambiente das consultas online. A solução de observação médica remota responde à necessidade de capacitar a consulta à distância de uma observação médica mais abrangente. 24 horas por dia, 7 dias por semana, no escritório, em casa ou em viagem. Através do kit de exame portátil é possível, de uma forma remota, captar sons de alta qualidade do coração e pulmões. Medir a temperatura e a frequência cardíaca ou criar imagens e vídeos em alta resolução para uma avaliação do ouvido, garganta e pele, permitindo um diagnóstico e tratamento adequados para muitas condições comuns. Disponível para clientes individuais, onde o próprio e a sua família podem efetuar consultas na Future Healthcare Virtual Clinic. A solução de observação médica remota está disponível igualmente para clientes empresariais. Com o um novo conceito de gabinete clínico, qualquer entidade dá a possibilidade aos seus colaboradores de terem acesso a um serviço de saúde digital. Com um acompanhamento integrado por uma equipa multidisciplinar, inclui o acesso a vida consultas, quando necessário, no seu local de trabalho. Numa época em que assistimos a profundas alterações nos cuidados de saúde, e em que a digitalização é cada vez mais uma realidade. A solução de observação médica remota da Future Healthcare Virtual Clinic é uma solução única no acompanhamento médico à distância, com todo o conforto, segurança e a garantia de acesso a uma rede de profissionais de saúde altamente qualificada. Future Healthcare. Ligamos a saúde. Preparamos o futuro. Half of the nursing team's time is devoted to administrative and procedural functions. Every day, communication with users' families consume hours of work by highly qualified professionals. In just a few years, millennials will be the caregivers of the baby boom generation. Hit Family is a new technology solution for active people and regular mobile app users who demand real-time information about the care of their loved ones. Hit Family promotes more efficient communication between the institution and the user's family, resulting in an increased overall satisfaction.